Welcome everyone. And let me know if um, there's an issue with hearing, just give me the thumbs up or down. So um, just welcome, welcome if you're new, welcome if you've been here before. <clears throat> my name is Mara Young, I'll introduce myself more later. So let's just settle into our seats, our cushions, our chairs, and take your seat. And as much as you can, letting go of the cares of the day and of the world, and just um, settling in, taking refuge in this um, beautiful, <clears throat> excuse me, Dharma Hall here at Common Ground or at home in your Zoom rooms. Maybe take a few breaths if the breath feels safe for you or just the touch sensations of the body sitting, supported by the Mother Earth. Noticing what's present for you tonight, however the mind or body, heart are feeling this evening. And I'd like to offer a little guidance at the beginning, and then I'll ring one bell and I'll we'll move into the topic for tonight with a little guided meditation on practicing with grief. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> So let's take a gentle journey of awareness through the body. But before we do that, connecting with your intention, with being present tonight, whatever brought you here. Maybe wanting some peace, some support for your practice, curiosity, just connecting with your own desire, intention, and wish to be happy, to be well. And then gently, at your own pace, just let your awareness begin to sweep through your body as if you're saying good evening to each region of your body like a good friend with the possibility <clears throat> of softening or, or, or relaxing, whether it does or not. So your head and face, round your jaw and mouth, You wish you can invite breath and awareness to soak into each area of your body like a sponge in water. And then down through your neck and throat, the place of your voice. Again, just follow along silently or at your own pace. You're just inviting your awareness to come into your body, embodied awareness. Your shoulders as you're ready, soaking into those shoulders, often a place of tension. Invitation to soften or rest. And then as you're ready, the journey down through your arms, all the way to your hands and fingers and fingertips. And perhaps some gratitude to your hands and fingers. And whenever you're ready, you can let your awareness move back up through your arms into your shoulders once more. And then into your chest and upper back. And continue this journey. It can include the breath, the soft awareness, a kind attention. An invitation to soften or rest the heart area, the softening the belly, the organs held there, the middle and lower back.
down through the pelvis and sit bones and all the way through the legs to the feet and the toes. Again, at your own pace. And if and when our attention wanders as it does, just coming back to the support of the body or the breath as an anchor. Continuing the journey, if you wish, through the body. And once you feel complete, feel free, many of you have been practicing for a while, to practice in the way that feels best for you tonight. Or you can stay with an anchor, a support, the breath, feeling the breath sensations or the breath in the body. The space between the breaths or using a neutral sensation or support like hearing or a touch sensation. And then after a time, if you wish, see if you can just rest in a more spacious, choiceless or open awareness, and then just balance between the anchor and then like opening the aperture of a camera, resting more in an open awareness, eyes open or closed with a relaxed yet supported posture. And let's sit. And meanwhile, thoughts, emotions, other sensations, experiences come through our sense doors, inner and outer. Just resting in the awareness that the anchor is support or more of that spacious open awareness as it is. And every now and then, just refresh your attention.
If you wish to follow along with this next portion of guided practice or continue sitting as you will. And if you need to adjust your posture to be more comfortably, take a moment to do so. <clears throat> Meditate on grief. Let yourself just settle in as you have with your breath, with your body. You might bring your awareness or a soft breath to the area of your chest or heart area. And if you wish, you might even want to put a hand there or just your attention. And just notice how your heart is feeling this evening. We connect or we be present with our heart as though we're holding a vulnerable being that we are. And as you continue to breathe or bring awareness to this area, you can bring to mind in whatever capacity feels safe or appropriate for you tonight loss or pain that you may feel, something you have grieved or are grieving, allowing the story, the feelings, the images, or whatever wants to arise to come to, to mind. And just hold them gently, taking your time, Letting the feelings come layer by layer, little by little, if they wish. Nothing to force or make happen. Just notice how it is this evening. And if nothing arises, be with that. Just be present with your heart as it is. Gently breathing or being present with sensation compassionately. But whatever feelings are there, maybe some pain or tears or hurt, anger, love, fear, sorrow, come as they will. Sometimes it's helpful to just softly notice or note. Sometimes it may be very faint or maybe strong. Often there's a multiple or complex layers of emotions. Just touch them gently with your kind attention and let them unravel out of your body and mind as they will. Just allowing whatever wants to emerge. And as you can, as you're able, just holding, holding it all with tenderness and compassion. Kindness for it all, for you and for others. may even be grief for the world or for the earth, maybe personal, relational, a loved one, a lost relationship or person or pet or friend. The grief we carry is part of the grief of the world. Hold it gently, let it be honored. You do not have to keep it anymore. 
You can let it go into the heart of compassion. Releasing the grief we carry is a long and tear-filled process at times. And it follows the natural intelligence of the body and the mind and the heart. Trust the unfolding. There are many ways to both free the heart, release, and be present with our grief. It can be sung, it can be written, it can be danced, it can be shared. Let the timeless wisdom within you carry you through grief and awaken a tender, open heart. Take care of yourself. If it feels overwhelming, just come back to your anchor, to the body. Let it go. Trust your own capacity to be present with the tender heart. Keep in mind that grief doesn't just dissolve. Instead, it arises in waves and gradually, with growing compassion, there comes more space around it. The heart opens in his own way, little by little. Gaps of new life break in, the rain clouds appear. The body relaxes, freer breaths may appear. This is a natural cycle you can trust in how life in the heart renews itself like the spring after winter. Trusting the heart knows the way. And now just continuing to sit, being present with what has arisen, or just now resting in awareness as it is, knowing that this may be a practice that you may wish to explore further on your own. And just rest in awareness with or without your anger support when you're ready.
Okay. So just ground yourself. If you've gone deep, just look around and maybe get up, stretch. And I'd encourage you to say hi to your neighbor and let's emphasize the community aspect. If you really need to stay with yourself, fine. But um, yeah, just say hey and uh, stretch your massage and your, yeah, a minute. <clears throat> Oh, welcome everyone in the Zoom room too. I don't know if you can say hi to each other or not, but uh, hello, hello, we see you. <laughs> yes. And thanks to Tyler and Otis who are our program hosts tonight. <clears throat> yeah. So shall we jump in? Okay. So I'm um, grateful to be here tonight. Um, Common Ground is one of my home sanghas. I'm a sangha-rich human in the Dharma. And I've been very fortunate um, throughout my life cycle and pray to continue to be, to have such wonderful communities to practice with and um, teachers <clears throat> and Dharma sisters and brothers. And when my Dharma sister... Shelly asked me if I could be available. I said yes, because I really want to support her in her retreat practice. And so occasionally I I fill in. And um and while I may not be here very often, this community is very dear to me. And I go way back to um before Mark and Wynn even had their center in their house and my beloved husband as well. So we've We've been around for a while and um, really are just wanting to share, you know, what I can to support one another in our practice and also living with um, life's challenges, changes, and, uh, you know, practicing with it. So, um, again, my name is Mara, and, and I have had the privilege and honor to companion many people in their journeys of healing and recovery and grief and loss. Um, I'm also, you know, a psychotherapist in private practice and have also been working at a, the Center for Grief and Loss in St. Paul as well, part time, and then teaching MBSR, mindfulness based stress reduction and happiness emotional healing courses through the U of M Center for Spiritual and Healing. I've been trained as a community Dharma leader through Spirit Rock and uh, have many wonderful Dharma uh, siblings and uh, been on this journey for a long time, gratefully, um, because I used to be quite depressed and had a lot of existential angst. And partly is I was born to this, and some of you know me or might have heard the story, but I'll just say that um, I am the daughter of a Holocaust survivor, so I don't maybe need to say more. And so I was born kind of into this work and into those deeper questions because um, I'm named after my um a uh, paternal grandmother who, of course, died in the Holocaust and none of the relatives survived. There, there were some cousins and uncles and things, but none of the close family. So, um, and to transform that kind of suffering has been a journey in my life and brought me, I believe, to practice to, to say, you know, what is the purpose? What is the meaning? Um, who are we? What is this about? So um, so I thought I'd lay, name tonight's talk, and this is a, a different version, a version of a talk I gave about a month or so ago about being with grief. And I call it being with grief, catching the thread of all sorrows. And that uh, it's, you know, the first noble truth of the Buddha is that um, of that, that there's suffering in life. It's not that life is suffering. It's just that this is how it is. And to me, when I heard these teachings, it was like, yes, they're finally acknowledging the fact that this is just part of life. It's not personal. There's not something wrong with me or just because I come from this family. The fact is there is dukkha, suffering. 
So the this poem spoke many times. We also use it regularly in the mindfulness-based stress reduction program by Naomi Shihab Nye, and forgive me if I can say, she's a Palestinian-American poet. And she says, she's written a poem called Kindness. And she says that before you know kindness is the deepest thing, you must know sorrow is the other deepest thing. You must wake up with sorrow. You must catch, speak it till your voice catches the thread of all sorrows and you see the size of the cloth. And then it is only kindness that makes sense anymore. Kindness that ties your shoes and sends you out into the day to mail letters to purchase bread. It is only kindness that raises his head from the crowd of the world and says, it is, I have been looking for you, and then goes with you everywhere like a friend. So one of the things that I've noticed, and I wonder if you have as well, is that, uh, that through our own heartbreak, through the gateway of the first noble truth of sorrow and suffering, that the heart can really open. And you can start to have more compassion for yourself, hopefully, and others. Often we miss the compassion for ourselves. But including ourselves, taking care of our hearts, opening our hearts to ourselves, and then sharing that deeper with others. I'm going to go over, I'm going to try to cover a lot of ground in a short time, but also let go a lot, too, as I get really attached. <laughs> So um, I'd like to share another line from one of my favorite poems, which is from Rumi the Guest House. Anyone familiar with that? Rumi the Guest House? Uh, there's different versions of it, and I'm really, sometimes upsets me that the full version isn't online. You can't find it, because the full version has, has a, a, the, the gateway to freedom, which I'll share with you. Rumi says, this being human is a guest house, every morning a new arrival. He says, an unexpected visitor comes, welcome and attend them all, even if they're a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of his furniture, treat each guest honorably. Welcome difficulty, learn the alchemy true human beings know, and here's the gateway to freedom. The moment you accept what troubles you've been given, the door opens. The moment we accept, oh, this is how it is. This is the Dharma. This is what's happening. Not what I expected. That's when the door can open. That's when we can really transform that suffering into wisdom and compassion. So that's just a couple of the excerpts from that poem, The Guest House. That was a guided meditation by Jack Cornfield. Uh, one of our spirit rock teachers and elder was the grief meditation. So this is what the Buddha said. This is how we contemplate our conditioned existence in this fleeting world, like a tiny drop of dew, a bubble floating on sea, like a flash of lightning in a summer cloud or the flickering lamp an illusion, a phantom, a dream. So conditioned existence to be seen is to be seen, said the Buddha from the Diamond Sutra. Have any of you seen the rainbows yesterday? They were just these ephemeral rainbows. A friend of mine that lives in the Longfellow neighborhood sent double rainbows, and I just saw a piece of a rainbow. And you know, that's our rainbow existence. It comes into form, it has beautiful, and then it dissolves. And we're all here for such a short time. And uh, I'm going to go over some of the basic teachings of the Buddha, a little micro mini overview about grief, and then how do we practice with it? So I really want to get to the how do we practice with it? Because I know, I mean, and I'll start with one of the classic stories. How many folks have heard of the mustard seed story? Yes. So I'll review it for some of us. And it, it's such a powerful story. I'm just going to quickly name it. So Kisa, Kisa Gotami, 
and the mustard seed. So she was a woman who had lost her child, her only child, and she was completely bereft and devastated. And she brought her, the body of her child to the Buddha and asked him if he could please restore the life of her child, her only child. And what did the Buddha say? The, the Buddha said, well, he basically said, go home to home and see if you can get a mustard seed, which is one of the most cheapest, little, tiny. Have any of you seen a mustard seed? It's just like a poppy seed. It's like a deer tick. <laughs> you know, it's really tiny. A, a little mustard seed. Better go to the co-op and look at a real mustard seed. They, they're good in cooking, Indian cooking. So almost every household has one, even poor households. He said, if you can find a mustard seed, one mustard seed from a home that is not known loss and sorrow or death, maybe I could help you out. So what do you think happened? Couldn't find it. And what did she do? She took refuge in the Dharma. She let go. She realized, and she later became an awakened devotee of follower and none of the Buddha, some Sangha, she realized the truth of how it is. So that's one of the classic stories about um, how she was able to come to some acceptance of the reality of death and, and come through her grief and sorrow. There are teaching after teaching. I'm just touching on a few, example after example. So there's something called the four thoughts that turn the mind to the Dharma. And uh, the first one is the preciousness of a human life. The second one is impermanence and death. The third is the principle of cause and effect or result. And the fourth is the inherent dissatisfaction of samsara in this human life or consensus reality. So... Let's unpack that just a little bit tonight. So first noble truth, there is suffering. It's not personal. And the happiness that we seek, can it be found in the bank, in the, in the stock market, in the material world? We hope so. Can we, can we find a guaranteed happiness that will last forever in our day-to-day -day life? Yeah, no, maybe so. So. Most of us know that, you know, like I, we were driving over here and we we're going, oh yeah, um, this car I'm driving is, is six years old. Um, and William said, oh, it'll last forever. I'm like, no, but you know, it gained an extra year because of the pandemic, even though it probably took a year or more off of our lives. <laughs> so, you know, it's just like, you know, you got to have a little gallows humor, I think. But realizing that, you know, everything is going to change. I, I just have to look in the mirror. Um, I look more and more like my mother did in her older age. I mean, it's just, you know, there's aging. There's, um, you know, there's a sickness. There's the heavenly messengers. Old age, sickness, death, and then the opportunity to awaken out of this dream of samsara. So we have these elements, aging, illness, death, and awakening. We are of the nature to get ill um, and die. And age, um, even if we become bionic, it, it won't last forever. So any, any comments or argument before I go on? Um, I mean, this is, sounds kind of grim, but, um, but actually embracing it, in a way, accepting that this is how it is kind of opens a different uh, motivation. Like, I'm only here for a short time. You know, what is my value? What's really important? It, it, can it support letting go? Can it support living with a more open, compassionate heart? Can it support me going to my cushion or going on retreat and making and taking time or going out of my way to um, be of service? You know, like what motivates us? I'm just here, this little short dance. And, and that, um, what does that mean to awaken? What does it mean to, to be present and awaken in this life? 
So there's many other basic teachings, but those are some of the principal ones. I'll just say that um, one interpretation of the four heavenly messengers are aging, the inconvenient truth or the spiritual gateway. Mindfulness is a medication for pain relief. Death is a spiritual teacher. And enlightenment or awakening is a path to unshakable happiness. So now I'd like to give you some examples of people who have been awakened and still grieve. So the question is, does an awakened Buddha or person, teacher, grieve? Yes, I see a nod. It's okay. You have to be quiet. So Marpa, the great Tibetan master and teacher of Milarepa, lost his son. He wept bitterly. One of his pupils one of his pupils had the gall, the chutzpah, to come up to him and say, Master, why are you weeping? You teach us that death is an illusion. And Martha said, Marpa said, death is an illusion, and the death of a child is an even greater illusion. But what Marpa was able to show his disciple was that while he could understand the truth about the conditioned nature of everything and the emptiness of forms, he could still be a human being. He could feel what he was feeling. He could be open, sorry, with his grief. He could be completely present to feel that loss and he could weep openly. And along those lines, the Buddha said when his two chief disciples, Sariputra, and I might not say it right, Mogdalana, Mogala, say, Mogdalana, his two chief disciples who were with him, and Sariputra is the one that held up the famous story where he holds up the lotus flower, um, and, it, you know, to, as a symbol of awakening, and they died before the Buddha, and they died within short time of each other, and the Buddha himself said, that it, at least it's quoted that it was like the sun and the moon went out of the sky and that the sangha felt empty so you know here is the buddha grieving feeling the loss and his heart actually broke that was one of the reasons when he saw our suffering and our delusion he offered us the loving kindness the metta sutta as a mother loves her child, her only child, practicing loving kindness came out of his sorrow for our suffering and his desire to support us in awakening. Another teaching that I'd like to share is the arrow or the dart sutra. Are any of you um, familiar with the arrows? Yes. So what story are we telling ourselves? Now, particularly as a therapist and someone doing grief work, and classic number one, self-blame. It's my fault. If only this, if I had done that, if they didn't do, you know, there's some sense of a story of guilt and responsibility for things that, that we're totally not in control of because the mind cannot accept that there was so powerless, there was nothing I could do. And I've had, you know, the, the painful, heartbreaking honor to sit with parents who've lost adult children to um, this horrible drug crisis, you know, to accidental overdoses, to um, death by suicide or homicide or other accidents, um, cancers, illnesses, I mean, everything, and um, in varying degrees. And and the stories that people come up with and the torment, it's not even hard enough to try to live with the loss, but the sense that I should have been able to do something. Just like Kisa Gotami, I should be able to bring my son or daughter or child back to life. And parents as well, or other people, or pets, like, oh, why didn't I take them to the vet sooner? Why didn't I notice? Or why did, you know, they get into the chocolate? And, you know, just, just stories of the heart that is a mind that cannot accept what is. 
it's often accepting it allows the grieving process to really come through. It can get really complex and stuck because it's also you get stuck in those stories and some people for years it's heartbreaking and can only sort of go through the motions of life. And it's not that you're you're going to live with your grief and loss throughout your life. I still grieve my parents. I go by a bagel shop. I smell. I think of my my father who used to bring bagels home. You know, it's not that you don't grieve. Um, you live with your grief throughout your life, but you don't have to suffer. You could suffer a lot less. So I have another story about that, about how do we practice with grief from a woman who lost a child, a parent, that I'd like to share, a very poignant story in a few moments. So the dart, the arrows are, what story am I telling myself? It feels true, but it's not the truth, the whole truth and nothing but. So, so now a little piece about grief. Um, permission to mourn. It's not weak. Um, it's it's we often come in a society that says um, you should be over it by now, and also you know, um, you know it's been a few months. Move on. Well, that's not how the heart works. So everyone grieves differently. Everyone has a different um, process. Grief is a process. It's not stages. In fact, the famous Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, that's a big misnomer. She herself admitted, said that that was not what she based her research on. She based her research on something else. I have it here. But it was not to be like this stages of grief that everybody goes through. And if you don't, there's something wrong with you. So I just want to find my little spot here. So where is Kubler-Ross? Well, basically, there's no rules about this. Here, Swiss psychiatrist Kubler-Ross introduced her five-stage grief model in her book on death and dying. It was based on her work with terminally ill patients and had been the subject of debate and criticism for years since. Because people studying her model mistakenly believe this is the order in which people grieve and all people go through these stages. So in other words, BS. Um, Kubler-Ross notes these stages are not linear and some people may not experience any of them. Others might only undergo a few rather than five. And it is more known that these stages are commonly observed um, anyway. The truth is that grief is a process and everyone is different. And we know this. We know some people find various ways. And just like we find different ways to be in practice or make a livelihood or cook a meal, um, it's very unique and that there is no specific time. And it's really painful to see how um, often um, in our culture and society, we don't know how to support each other, and we have certain expectations of what it should look like. So I really want to blow that up. And also about talking. Like um, I did a workshop in a workplace uh, a few months ago, and people said, well, I don't want to upset them. Should I ask how they are? I'm like, I think they're probably already upset, <laughs> you know? And also, you, if you're worried like they're at work, they might not want to talk about it. You could say, I'm here, or I'm thinking of you. You know, some indication, but often sometimes people, they don't want to talk or say, is it okay? Is it okay if I ask you, you know, check it out. But I think this sense like, well, I don't want to upset them. We don't talk about it. We act, we ask like, I've had clients come in and say, my relatives, they call and then they just talk about their lives and they didn't even ask me. Um, really lonely. And then often it's the neighbor or someone else they walk a dog with that says, hey, how's it going? I've been thinking of you. So it's, it's really important to look at how you are with loss and loss of others and then to, in your own expectations. And 
There's also something called grief brain, which people don't realize. Have any of you heard that term, grief brain? It's literally where the prefrontal cortex, that part of processing and having it all together goes offline. And it can go offline for quite a while. And I've seen people who are very accomplished, you know, physicians and either other therapists or people, professors or preachers or ministers. And they're like, I can't seem to focus. I can't get it together. It's like the brain has gone through a trauma. Um, loss is like trauma. It's like your life sometimes has been like hit by a bus. And it's just a lot of patience and compassion. So sometimes that happens with other experiences. I think a lot of us had grief brain during COVID and might be still recovering um, from other kinds of losses. And there's so many kinds, right? We'd be here for days naming all the different kinds of losses. It's complex. And some of it comes in chunks. And I literally talked to someone earlier today about the fact, like, I don't get it. I had deaths earlier in my life, and now I'm in my midlife, and this loss just blew me out of the water. And so they've reached out. And I said, well, often the losses of a lifetime come up, and it's particularly unresolved ones. So often trauma comes up, unresolved, other losses, things that didn't work out, marriages, relationships, that all can come up in a grief process. So I'd like to share a poem. Let's see, are we are flying by with the time and we're supposed to, we have some time, okay. So I'd like to say something else just about the linear thing. Think of grief almost like a loop or like waves, riding waves like Ornfield said. It's, it's like we go through cycles and it can keep changing. Um, and to be really patient and loving with yourself around it. So I want to get to the practicing with it part. And I'd like to shift that with a poem called Allow, that some of you might be familiar with. And it's by um, Donna Faludes. There is no controlling life. Try controlling a lightning bolt containing a tornado. Dam a stream and it will create a new channel. Resist and the tide will sweep you off your feet. Allow and grace will carry you to a higher ground. The only safety lies in letting it all in. The wild, the weak, the fears, the fantasies, the failures, the success. When loss rips off the doors of the heart, or sadness veils your vision with despair. Practice becomes simply bearing the truth in the choice to let go of your known way of being. The whole world is revealed to your new eyes. A new way of being. So this is a very poignant story I ran across and I thought this practitioner it was actually published in Lion's Roar, a Buddhist magazine. And this practitioner shared a process of how they stayed with their practice through their mindfulness and being with the sensations of grief and not lost in the, the arrows or the stories. I'd like to share a portion of this. So... She, I believe it's a woman, I'm not sure, but just to give you a flavor of where she was at, she said, I had little or no energy. Changing the toilet paper roll seemed insurmountable, grief brain. So I purchased an open arm toilet paper holder to make it easier, but then couldn't find the energy to install it. Even brushing my teeth was a challenge. She had lost, uh, I believe, a son or a daughter. I, grief involving less suffering included little or no mental stories. I learned to disengage my mind and focus on my body. I focused on the physical sensation of grief in my body 
without adding anything from the mind. I was able to get in touch with where my body, I, in my body, I experienced a felt sense of grief, which included a heavy sensation in the chest area, a strained sensation in the throat, moistness and tears in the eyes. The ability to be present to these physical sensations of grief had an effect over time of purifying the grief. Now every cell in my body seemed to carry the fact of my son's death together with the adjoining cell, accepting it. Of course I miss him. I think about him every hour of every day, but mostly it's with a smile on my face, remembering him without a demand he be alive or that things be any different than they are. When I could get to the point of turning toward the grief without adding the story, just be present to the physical sensations of grief in my body, I suffered less. Experiencing grief was still painful, but the mental suffering lessened. Over time with repetition, being with grief in this way had a purifying effect so that it no longer weighed me down. And there I experienced the vast empty nature of the mind that could make space for and hold my grief, no matter how big it wanted to be. Turning toward grief and being fully present to it takes courage, great heart, and patience. So the space opened up for her, where there was space for her to feel and be present with the grief. And I don't have her names. Thank you. Another practice is being with grief. I mentioned riding the waves, which is a wonderful metaphor. And then also expansion and contraction. Early on in my Vipassana Theravadan practice, I had a teacher who's actually established something called the Vipassana Support Institute. It was brilliant. And he would guide people to watch expansion and contraction and body sensations, to be with difficult emotions. And believe me, I had a lot to process. And it was all I could do to sit on those cushions, especially those 10-day retreats. And, and it was just expand, contract, watch it change like a cloud, you know, gets more intense. If any of you practice with expansion and contraction, just watching it get more intense, tighter, moving, changing, just observing impermanence in the experience. Even if you can, noticing the thoughts. Um, we were recently in um, out of state traveling in Utah, and I don't know if you've been there, but we were sitting outside in this, in at a higher altitude, the sky it was just brilliant when it was clear, and these mesas and open sky, and it was so easy to meditate like in the space, because the space was right there, and you could just sit there and rest in the space, and I was literally watching and I had an, uh, an issue with a friend that was bothering me. And it was literally watching cloud thoughts like, <laughs> and it was like brilliant. I was just like, huh. It was like contraction, loss, then, oh, back. It was like one of the most clear practices I've had for a long time when I was suffering because it was really hurt. It was one of it's one of my oldest friends of decades, and she and I have a thing. We're actually going to process it tomorrow. Help me! So I have to <laughs> practice this while I'm talking with her. Um, the other thing that was so cool is that being in an environment where you could literally see in the rocks. Have you, any of you been out there, these layers, they call it the grand staircase. I had no idea what that was. And the, the top layer, the most recent layer, that's after the ones from the sea and all the different colors, white, red, you know, is chocolate layer. <laughs> I love that because I love chocolate. So, so I was like, God, you know, I can just... I had this mind bending shift of experience and I talked to someone else that spent a lot of time there and they, they asked me about it because they too recognize that shift. 
And I think that the Buddha Dharma is that shift in your view, in your perspective. You realize how infinitesimal you are in your life. I imagine you see it like if you saw the um, the eclipse or you went out and saw the aurora when it was here or the Milky Way, where you just are in seeing evolution of the earth and and it does something it's sort of like and the more i was learning and the guide we friend we were with was telling me i was literally my mind was blown i was just like and i said this is dharma for me i feel like this is the the space of timeless awareness of of the the arising and passing of everything and it was quite a you can't articulate that kind of thing and again it was just a moment of just like Oh. And so I think sometimes that's helpful is like what gives you a perspective because we get so caught, so lost and also compassion for that. So I want to I think there's one more practice and I want to enc encourage you in a closing poem to share if you want. So we have some time. And then this is this is. Um, Again, I don't have a clear reference. It's an article called Sadness and Grief as Spiritual Teachers. So when I talk about everything that happens is an opportunity for growth. It's, a, it's one of those reframes us therapists love to give people. I say, you're going to kick me in the teeth right now, but this is one of those opportunities for growth. You know, this is turn, the alchemy of turning, can I swear, shit to gold okay <laughs> crap to gold all right you know like good when i when i went to university of iowa there was a lot of this pig poop smell in out there and and i, I learned that pig poop the stinkier this this the compost you put the better the brighter flowers and crops you get so it really is true okay maybe our gar gardeners Gardeners can uh, tell me otherwise, but it's it, it's amazing. And 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 then when I go by and I see somebody's gorgeous small flowers and I smell the poop, I'm it's even in Minnehaha Park. I tell you. So um, here are the points. This person says the main obstacle developing wise relationship with sadness is we resist it. Rumi again, right? The moment we the door op we accept it, the door opens. This is because we get hooked about fears about it, hooks such as it will overwhelm me, it'll never go away if I allow it, it's so painful. Such thoughts prevent us from connecting with the emotions to see what they actually are like. And some of you know about the RAIN acronym, working with difficult emotions, recognizing them with awareness, um, being curious, investigating them, and then nurture or non-attachment. So so there's various ways to work with um, Tara Brock, others on working with the emotions. We wanna go under into where the rawness is, right? Where the sensation like that mother described. So second is it can feel like a big risk to open to something we fear that might overwhelm us. But many people have found that mind states such as depression and sadness are workable as other emotions if again, the dart if we let go of the story and pay attention to the experience in our bodies. So again, our practice is designed to support us to do, do that. And then number three is that with other emotions, we only need to deal with them one moment at a time. See, that's the thing is we often say, this is gonna last forever, I can't stand it, it'll never end. That's a story, it just, Sometimes it just, it, it amazes sometimes, like, do you ever have that experience? Like you're with it and then it's gone. It's like, it's a bubble on the stream or it might stick around for a while, but then suddenly you're enjoying and laughing at something. It's not a concrete, it's, it's a mind state. It's very changing and porous. That's where expansion contraction, sometimes it's heavy, sometimes it's light, sometimes it's like the rainstorm, right? So um, all you need to ask yourself is, what is this moment of sadness like or grief like? And number four, I think you'll love this. Mindfulness always works. <laughs> However, one cannot always be mindful. 
sometimes emotions are too overwhelming. Don't you love that paradox? Mindfulness always works, but sometimes you can't be mindful because you get overwhelmed. Um, I know that quite well. If you are able to be mindful of emotion, great. If not, guess what you do? What do you think? Come on. What do you, wait. Hmm? You strike yourself. You strike yourself. No, distract. Distract yourself. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. He said, distract yourself. <laughs> Thank you, Pietro. So, um, yes, that's another way, many ways to work with that. And if not, by all means, try all the other tools that work for you. Could call a friend, distract yourself, watch a bad movie, eat some ice cream, whatever, chocolate, especially. And then compassion, compassion is the tool that can really help. Compassion. Use those Brahma Viharas, the Four Noble Abodes, loving kindness, compassion, uh, the loving kindness towards, towards the suffering, and then the joy of letting go, or and then um, the equanimity, which is the queen or the royal path of, okay, this is how it is. This too shall pass. I literally was on a retreat where I was in a hell realm, a long retreat. And our teacher um, gave each of us an emergency little note. He's a very creative teacher, this teacher. And it was a long retreat. And, um, and then we had a week of this month retreat where we were like just practicing completely on our own. And you could get help if you needed it. And he gave everybody a little note. And I remember one night when ticks were crawling and my mind was going on fire and I opened up my emergency note and you know what it said? This too shall pass. <laughs> <laughs> and he was right. It worked. So this too shall pass. And you know, that's one of my go-tos. That's one of my equanimity phrases that this too shall pass, that everything, all conditioned things arise and pass away. Right? And knowing this deeply brings the greatest peace, happiness, which is peace. So I'll finish up with a poem called Unbroken by, um, and I have extra fun poems that I won't have time to read. And one is calling, is crying until you, you sing. Um, but this one's called The Unbroken by um, Rish, Ria, Ria Roshini, Ria. It's in the book, The Wild Edge of Sorrow, and it's online. There is a brokenness out of which comes the unbroken, a shatteredness out of which blooms the unshatterable. There is a sorrow beyond all grief, which leads to joy and a fragility out of which depths emerge strength. There is a hollow space too vast for words through which we pass with each loss out of whose darkness we are sanctioned into being. There is a cry deeper than all sound whose serrated edges cut the heart as we break open to the place inside which is unbreakable and whole while learning to sing. A cry deeper than all sound whose serrated edges cut the heart as we break open to the place inside, which is unbreakable and whole. So let's sit for a minute. So I promised I'd leave time for Otis to give a little talk, and I we need to dedicate. So let's let's have a few some time for five minutes, four or five minutes for sharing or questions or comments. And again, forgive me if anything doesn't fit. Throw it in the garbage can. These are just um, some of the ways that I've woven 
some pieces from my practice and what's inspired me to work with grief and loss and to support others in their journey. So um, how are you doing? Um, feel free to share. And uh, thanks. Thanks. So Thank you, everyone. We're all brought to some of it. <laughs> Something? Oh, yes, please. Yeah. Do you want to say your name if you're comfortable? If not, it's okay. Sure. Hi. Hi. Connor. Connor is Con the name. Connor. Connor, sir. Yeah, there we go. It's yeah, right yeah. here. All good. All good. Connor. Yeah. Um, I was hoping maybe you could speak a little bit on inherited will and legacy after grief and when self destructive inherited thoughts of mind or mind patterns like when you catch yourself saying oh i'm so much like my father oh i'm so much like my mother and working through that portion of grief so is there any positive legacy in there is there anything that yeah would... absolutely i would say so I would say just as much as there is the the negative. Okay. So are you the same person? Are you approaching life the same way as your person? I don't mean to be. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. You know, I think the part of waking up, I mean, I, I actually um, notice that it's kind of shocking how much I look and sound and move like my mom, but I kind of am now, my relationship to that has changed. And my mom had a lot of suffering and a lot of neuroses and quirks and crazy, but I've, I've sort of embraced some of it. Like, okay, yes, I'm passionate like her. Yes, I like to talk. Uh, yeah, but also I, I have my own path and I also appreciate and have focus on some of her strengths like she she wrote poetry she was creative she loved music you know I think of some of the positive qualities and also um it's helped me be more mindful like kind of be aware and also we have our own path and practice so I think trusting your good heart and notice that those are shaming and kind of Self, negative self-fulfilling type of thing so so I hope you can get support because people say stuff like that and it's really not what what's the purpose of that is it help you feel good about yourself I mean and I've heard many people share that and I'm like you're a different person and then watching that start to transform and actually they can reconnect with some of their people even the difficult ones in a new way it's almost like you have to clear off those shameful negative dark stories so i don't know if that makes sense but i but if you have some way that you've worked with it please you know because i think our others have because um it's common that we hear those kind of things you're just like your mom or you're i used to hear oh you're stubborn like da 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 I'm like I'm like, I'm glad I'm stubborn. <laughs> Serve me well. <laughs> to me, not to monopolize the time that we have here. Yes, um, yeah. You know, I think it was probably my sophomore year of college when I realized that I don't have to necessarily enjoy or want to see it as something to aspire to the kind of love that they were giving to the world around them yeah. and realizing that that doesn't have to be my my role model that that doesn't have to be the entryway into loving others um so that was i think the main thing that helped me work through that when, beautiful yeah i had my great losses <laughs> beautiful thank you great thank you wisdom yeah absolutely bows to that any other comment before we um turn it over to yeah we've got a few more minutes Anybody from the Zoom room? Can they share? Hello. Hi. 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 Hi.
right. Can you hear me? Oh, Can you... I hear a voice. I hear a voice. Is that Claire? Yeah, yeah. Hi. Yeah, go for it. Well, um, I have uh, some nephews who lost their father, my brother, and I have um, been really worried about bringing him up because I'm worried that my nephews will, uh, well, one in particular, I've talked with some of them, but, but the eldest seems like he really, he doesn't want to open up. And I, I certainly don't want to alienate him. Um, what do you suggest? You know, again, people are in different places and stages. And I think with, you know, with, I don't, did you say how old he is? He's uh, 17. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, he might not be ready, but I think you're, you're sending him a lot of loving kindness, compassion in your practice and just letting him know that you're available. And also if there's some worrisome behaviors or issues that come up, um, maybe, I don't know if there's someone else that might suggest he gets some um, grief therapy or bereavement, um, but I think it's very tender. And, um, you know, we all shut down or we don't want to go there and he may be coping as best he can. Or sometimes, you know, kids and teen teenagers particularly, they can be very creative. Um, some of my colleagues work a lot more than I do. I don't work with teens and kids. It just breaks my heart. I used to work with teens and some families. I work with some families, but um, it's they might be drawing writing listening to their music they might be doing stuff with their friends you know i think it depends it really depends and so trust your heart if there's caring adults that are keeping an eye but sometimes you know they may be you know um you can offer and then send through the heart but again you don't want to force or push unless there's something really scary happening then you have to make an intervention does that make sense yeah thank you yeah i don't know what do you what are you with him in the same area or no i see him a couple times a year and um, yeah he's my godson so i i try to at least mm -hmm. open the window um mm -hmm. but i don't yeah. want him to scuttle away from me you know <laughs> Yeah, well, it sounds like you really are doing your best to let him know, and he knows you love him. So, yeah, it's hard. It's hard. So take care of your heart, too. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So let's uh, finish up today. Let's just dedicate the merit, and I'll let Otis take over. And uh, thank you, Tyler and Otis, for being the hosts and keeping it all together. And thank you all for your practice and your presence. And that any benefits from our practice tonight and in as a whole go to the benefit and awakening of all sentient beings. And if we like, you know, there's so many places of suffering right now. We, do, we can just softly name them to ourselves or just think of all of the wars and the, the torment and the dissension and hatred. May all sentient beings everywhere be free from greed, hatred, delusion. May we all know peace, happiness, and true freedom. And uh, any benefits of my practice go to the benefit of awakening of all beings. So, thank you. Okay. And thank you for the teaching tonight. Um, just a reminder that Common Ground runs on the principle of Donna, which is that all programs are freely offered to anyone, um, and then any offerings back to uh, the center are also um, expected to be freely given. There, there are no, there are no uh, given expectations for anything. But on nights when we have a guest teacher, a large portion of whatever is um, donated that night goes to the teacher. So we appreciate that um, 
And again, appreciate the teachings and appreciate everybody for coming tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And just so you know, usually when I have Donna, I it's like it supports me to go on retreat and give Donna. So just so you know, <laughs> I like to give Donna. So. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night and take good care.